Our main story tonight concerns lunch, the meal that you save for friends that aren't interesting enough for dinner. <laughs> Specifically, we're going to talk about school lunch, which is, among other things, the inspiration for this bonkers PSA from the 1980s. I'm tired of candy, tired of gum, tired of hunger, and food that's no fun. I'm tired of pretending I don't like spaghetti, but school lunch keeps me roaring ready at rock steady. Pizza, spaghetti, burger. With Chow Daddy in your school cafeteria, it's the fun place to be for lunch. Desserts. Okay. Let's break that down. Straight away, we open on a close-up of Chow Daddy, whose very name makes him sound like the undefeated pussy-eating champion of the world. <laughs> then he claims, I'm tired of candy, tired of gum. A bold choice if you're writing something kids need to relate to, before continuing, I'm tired of pretending I don't like spaghetti, and what? <laughs> Who's forcing you to do that, CD? He then throws in a moonwalk, cementing the notion that he's a public access Michael Jackson from Thriller, and ends by simply listing foods, ending with the concept of desserts. <laughs> I don't know how that encouraged kids to eat school lunch, but it's fascinating to watch, and one day I'm sure we'll find out how much weapons-grade cocaine it took to come up with that ad. The lunches Chow Daddy is referring to come from the National School Lunch Programme, the federally assisted programme that provides meals to school children. It was launched in 1946 and since then has grown to become massive, with over 90% of public schools participating in it. Last year alone, the programme provided 4.6 billion lunches, which is incredible. But school lunches are also the subject of constant criticism from kids, which shouldn't be surprising. Kids are picky. Whole new foods are created to combat that. Gogurt only exists because some kid was like, over my dead body will I eat yogurt with a spoon? I'd like it to come out of a plastic esophagus, and the market complied. <laughs> but nevertheless, if you ask students for their opinions on their school lunches, they will be brutally honest. If you had to describe school lunch in one word, how would you describe it? I would say weird, rancid, raw, unappetizing, unedible. I don't like the taste or the texture. Food is always cold. Okay. Portions are like small. No, literally, they gave us two chicken tenders. What am I gonna do with two chicken tenders? I mean, to be fair, she is right about that. The correct number of chicken tenders is not two. That isn't the correct number for any food. I want my chicken tenders in odd prime numbers. Three is a snack, five is a meal, and seven is a cry for help. <laughs> but I'm not here tonight to shit on school lunches, because the very fact they happen at all is remarkable. School nutrition directors often say they run the biggest restaurant in town, which doesn't seem like an overstatement when you see this snapshot from a school in L.A. Usually, they start lunch around 9 o'clock. We have to cook everything in, in, in batches because we don't have enough ovens. And then, so, in the, from 10 to, I'd say, 11.30, everybody's panning the whole time. So, we do the hamburgers first, we get those going, we get the fries going, then we get pizza going, we get the, the chicken nuggets for the vegan menu today, so it's constantly batch, batch, batch. We serve about, I'd say, 1,500 a day or more. Uh, that includes breakfast, lunch, and supper. OK, putting aside the cognitive dissonance of having chicken nuggets be the vegan menu item of the day, <laughs> that is really impressive. If you had to do 1,500 of whatever your job is even once, you would snap. If you, if you were a vet and had to give one dog its ear medicine, fine. Ten dogs, that's a lot, but OK. A hundred, this is getting unreasonable. But 1,500 dogs need ear medicine and some of them are vegan? Just walk the fuck out and start a new life somewhere else. Lunch programs are such a massive undertaking. They've even been referred to as a daily miracle. And for many kids, school meals are actually their most reliable source of nutrition, which is why it is so important the program work as well as it can for as many kids as it can. Unfortunately, in too many places, that is just not the case. So given that, tonight, with many schools around the country just starting back up again, Let's talk about school lunches. And let's start with the quality of the food, because those students weren't entirely off base. Not every meal served inside a school is perfect. But that's often because school cafeterias are having to operate under severe budget constraints. School lunches are subsidised by the government, which sets a ceiling on how much it'll pay for any given meal. But that ceiling is set way too low. One survey of school districts found that around two-thirds said the funds they received were not sufficient to cover the costs of producing lunch, which makes sense when you find out they only get around $4 per meal, which has to cover everything from food costs to equipment upgrades to staff salaries. 
Just listen to this former head chef at Noma, one of the top restaurants in the world, who founded a company that places professional chefs in school kitchens. Explain what happens to that $4 and everything it has to go toward. That's actually for maintenance, that's for paying people to make the food. So when, when it's all said and done, you have about a dollar and a quarter for food. Making food a meal that kids really want to eat for $1.25 is super challenging. Yeah, of course it is. $1.25 doesn't cover the cost of food pretty much anywhere. Even at Costco, the hot dog and soda combo <laughs> is $1.50. <laughs> and that is only because the co-founder once said, and this is true, if you raise the price of the fucking hot dog, <laughs> I will kill you. That is a real quote from a true leader. <laughs> so the budget alone is a real challenge, as is the fact that it's important kids actually take the meals, because the government only reimburses schools for meals that students take, meaning if kids don't like what's being served and ignore it, the school doesn't get any money and goes into the hole. So you need an appealing meal that comes in at rock-bottom prices. That's a key reason why many schools opt to just heat and serve pre-May made meals. And that approach has opened them up to criticism. Jamie Oliver, a man to whom I'm surprisingly not related, <laughs> had a show in 2010 where he tried to make over the menus in a West Virginia school, and he made a big show of being appalled at what the children were being fed. When I went in the freezer, the freezer was just basically an Aladdin's cave of processed crap. OK, so this is pizza for tomorrow, yeah? Yes. So you have pizza for breakfast, but then they have it for, what, lunch tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Bloody hell. So this meat is already cooked, yeah? Yeah. When it grows up, it'll be scrambled eggs. So that is scrambled egg? I've never yeah. seen that it's, before. It's egg. We steam it. I didn't know what most of it was, and when I don't know what something is, the alarm bells go off. Do you honestly think that we could do from raw steak every day? Do you really? Yes. OK. <laughs> I have a lot of questions there, but I guess my first is, I know I have a British accent and my name is almost his name and I have a show where I essentially tell America that it's doing everything wrong, but... <laughs> am I like that? <laughs> Please tell me that I'm not like that. <laughs> because while the dream of every single school cooking from scratch is a lovely idea, it might not be feasible for a lot of school districts. Not only are there the cost and labour issues, but they also need to navigate strict nutritional guidelines. The federal government sets standards for things like the amount and types of fruits and vegetables required to be on a plate, but it can be hard to meet them on a tight budget. Something famously illustrated during the Reagan era, when his administration slashed the federal school lunch budget, then briefly tried bending the nutritional guidelines to a truly ridiculous extent. Also getting attention today was that elementary school lunch sampled by members of Congress yesterday. The meal consisting of a small meat patty, six French fries, a glass of milk and ketchup, classified as a vegetable, was representative of new federal guidelines issued to save money on subsidized school lunches. Now, much has been made about the whole ketchup as a vegetable thing, but I don't think people talked enough about the mystery meat patty <laughs> being served with a glass of milk. That looks like a hamburger with terminal illness. <laughs> it looks like the cracked soil of a Dust Bowl-era farm. You know, I read once that ultramarathon runners in Death Valley would eat bananas, then throw them up, and the banana vomit would bake in the sun, forming little patties on the ground, and I bet it looks like that. The point is... Ketchup isn't a vegetable, Reagan made things worse, and I've been trying to offload that banana fact for the past five years. <laughs> and the thing is, even when, with good intentions, we manage to raise the nutritional standards for lunches, it can then be a real challenge to make them appetising. During the Obama administration, access to school lunches was expanded greatly thanks to the 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which also updated guidelines to make meals more nutritious. And while that act produced great results overall, some students hated the new healthier options, sharing photos with the hashtag Thanks Michelle Obama, which, <laughs> to their credit, is funny. When the nutrition went high, the kids went low. <laughs> but, but it did take some trial, error and flexibility to make those new standards work. For instance, the Act required that breads had to be whole grain rich, but as one food service director in New Mexico said, many families in the Southwest will not accept whole grain tortillas, and I quote, we simply cannot afford to feed our trash cans. <laughs> Similarly, a school district in Mississippi tried to make a 100% whole grain biscuit, which was not received as well by students, so the school is now allowed to operate on 80% of whole grains instead, which does feel like a good compromise, because a whole grain biscuit 
is not a biscuit. <laughs> At that point, let's just make ice cream sandwiches where the cookies are celery and the ice cream is children's Motrin, because <laughs> it seems words don't matter anymore. The fact is, school nutrition directors have to strike a delicate balance between the perfect and the achievable. That former Noma chef you saw earlier gets incredibly frustrated when talking about how chefs who work outside of school kitchens tend to look down on some of the food that he makes now. It's funny because we've had a lot of peers, a lot of my peers have come and seen what we do and they're disappointed by what we do. Um, Your colleagues are disappointed. Yeah, in the sense that, oh, I thought this was going to be something else. I thought you were going to be serving a different type of food. And I said, I don't give a fuck what you think, because it's not about you. You know, if you have $1.25 to feed people, and that's your constraint, and you're feeding kids, and you start to prioritize things like sustainability and locality and seasonality, then you don't fucking understand how the world works. You don't understand what food costs. Yeah, he's right. I I'm not sure why the decor of that stage is TED Talk in the jungle, but he <laughs> is right. It's all very well for Jamie Oliver to want schools to cook from scratch with fresh ingredients all the time. But, but it's a lot harder to be idealistic when you're slinging a thousand portions of hot lunch to kids in a cramped kitchen all in 15 or 20 minutes. Reality is a hell of a sous chef. But, but let's say you could create lunches that were nutritious, delicious and affordable. That still doesn't address the bigger problem with our school lunch programme, which is that in many states it is not feeding everyone who needs it. And that is a huge problem. Because, as I mentioned, for lots of kids, it might be their only guaranteed meal of the day. As this cafeteria worker in Washington State explains. Yeah, a lot of kids go home during, I mean, during the Christmas break, they don't get have food. They, they don't have food. So they're so happy to come back to school. Actually, um, the reason I came a lunch lady is because I wanted to give the kids food that didn't get it at home like I didn't. Well, I was always happy to go to school just because I get to eat. <laughs> we, we didn't have a lot of food. And when you go to school, you know you're going to eat, and it's, that's worth going to school. Her commitment to feeding kids is beautiful, and she is right. Anything is more appealing if you know there's going to be food there. A work meeting, a wedding, <laughs> even giving blood. You think I'm doing that <laughs> out of altruism? Where else can a grown man drink apple juice and eat little cookie packs <laughs> free of judgment? Drain me, Nurse Gwen, drain me, but keep the Lorna Doons coming. <laughs> so school lunch is a critical social good. The problem is, in order to get a free or reduced price lunch, Families have to fill out eligibility paperwork, and that alone can be prohibitive. There may be language barriers for some parents and, for others, social stigma. As one expert points out, oftentimes these forms are on a brightly coloured piece of paper. They say free school lunch form. And for parents, it can feel like the form is effectively saying, I can't afford to feed my child, and they're having to ask their kid to hand that form to a teacher. On top of that, the thresholds to qualify are often so low, they exclude families who need it. This year, a family of four earning around $40,000 a year or less is eligible for free meals. And one earning around $58,000 or less is eligible for reduced price meals. But if you make a penny more than that, your kids have to pay full price. And that can quickly become a steep financial burden. My, my son used to always tell me that he didn't eat because he didn't want to make me have to pay for it. She says she's always made just above the cutoff to qualify for the federal free and reduced price lunch program, but her budget is still tight. School lunch for her kids cost more than $250 a month. With four kids in school, that adds up really quick. Of course it does, and kids clearly should not be refraining from eating for financial reasons. They should be refusing to eat for one of the multitude of standard kid reasons, such as the food looks weird, it's too hot outside, it's too cold outside, or I saw a bird. <laughs> and kids whose families can't afford to pay can accumulate what's commonly called lunch debt. And the cost to schools can be significant. One sampling of just over 800 districts found that their total meal debt exceeded $17 million last year. Unfortunately, the solution some have hit on is to pressure families for that debt, and sometimes children directly, through a practice known as lunch shaming. You may have heard stories about how some schools have given kids who owe money an alternative lunch, like a cold cheese sandwich, while others required students do chores. A report from last year found some schools in Kansas wouldn't allow kids with unpaid debt to participate in activities, or would even withhold grades from parents until debt was paid. And still other kids have been forced to wear wristbands or had their hands or arms stamped to show they're behind in payment. And incredibly, some tactics have been even worse than that. 
Earlier this month, the Wyoming Valley West School District in northeastern Pennsylvania sent letters to about 40 families telling them their children could be sent to foster care if they didn't pay up. The foster care issue, just it just had me, I, I couldn't believe that that's what it said. Four other Wyoming Valley West School Board members agree, as does school administrator Joe Muth. He signed that letter. It could have been toned down. I, I don't know how to describe other than in writings, we could have toned it down a notch. Okay, could have toned it down a notch is putting it mildly. Also, that is something that guy should have realised before signing the letter. Frankly, Clippy should have popped up and said, it looks like you're threatening to separate families and throw children in foster care over a few hundred bucks of lunch debt. Are you sure you want to fucking do that? <laughs> lunch debt's become such a ubiquitous problem. The kids finding ways to pay it off is now a trope of supposedly heartwarming human interest stories like these. A second grader is paying off the school lunch debt for everybody at his school and kids in six other schools. On Tuesday, fifth grader Nathan Kramer giving the school district a check for $7,300, money he raised to help pay for his classmate's school lunch debt. Caitlin decided all of the money she raised would go towards paying off the school lunch debt of 123 students in her San Diego school district. How about that? Five years old, guys. Yeah, it's amazing when someone that young just knows to pay it forward. I mean, it is amazing, but she shouldn't have to do it. Let a five-year-old spend that money on five-year-old shit, you know, like a slinky or Play-Doh or fingerlings, little creatures for your fingers, monkeys, unicorns, this cunty little bird. They're adorable. <laughs> and, and they make you feel alive. And the reason I know that is I actually have one on <laughs> right now, but even this isn't managing to cheer me up. You failed me, you little fucker. <laughs> it's frankly no wonder that when you combine the stigma of receiving a free or reduced price lunch and the risk of racking up debt, even kids who are eligible can end up choosing not to participate. In fact, in 2019, nearly 30 million students were eligible for the meals, but only 22 million received them, meaning over 7 million eligible students missed out on meals, with experts arguing that stigma played a big role in that, which is terrible. And at this point, I actually have some good news because there is a way to solve a lot of the problems that I've just shown you. It's a policy known as universal free meals. Basically, every kid at every school can have breakfast or lunch at school if they want it. And while I know that might sound like a utopian dream, the thing is, we actually already did it for two years during the pandemic. Federal lawmakers introduced a waiver program that paid for free breakfasts and lunches for every public school kid in the country, regardless of family income. The waivers also increased the reimbursement rate for each meal by around 20%, meaning schools had more money to spend on making and serving meals. And early research suggests that had real benefits. A survey of school districts representing over 5 million students found that in 2021, average daily participation in lunch increased by approximately 1.4 million, with 95% of districts reporting it reduced child hunger, and 82% reporting the programme supported academic achievement. In short, way more kids were eating every day and it was helping them in school. The waiver programme worked. But in June of 2022, it expired. And unfortunately, some lawmakers were completely fine with that. By returning these programs back to normal, we can uphold our responsibility to taxpayers and the principle that aid should be targeted and temporary. Wow, that is heartless. Aid should be targeted and temporary. Sounds like something a Reagan action figure would say when you pull it string. <laughs> Along with take that welfare queen and Jodie Foster sure would be impressed if I died. <laughs> and when the cutoff came, teachers who saw the program roll back firsthand can tell you it was rough. On the first day of school this year, I announced to my students that school lunches were no longer free. And this moment stays with me. The confusion, the darting eyes, the questions. There were students who realized in that moment that they were not going to eat that day. For fuck's sake, no teacher should have to do that, especially that one who clearly cares about her students. I know the fun teacher when I see one. <laughs> and that is the fun teacher right there. Bright, colour-blocked outfit, fun glasses, purple hair. There is a class of misfit seventh graders for whom she is their absolute queen. <laughs> if you get assigned to Miss Jung's class, you are making dioramas, you're doing non-stop skits, and you're building the sickest plastic bottle hydroponic garden system in the entire school. Miss <laughs> Jung's got passes to the Science Museum of Minnesota, and if you go with her, you're touching a dinosaur bone. <laughs>
For many families, the programme expiring meant they had to navigate the eligibility forms for the first time. One school nutrition director in Ohio said she had to deny one single mother who told her she'd missed the cut-off for reduced meals by just $100 of gross income. And all this resulted in a lot fewer kids getting lunches and students from low-income families across the country and now accruing lunch debt in record numbers. Now, now, to their credit, some states have refused to go backward, and these eight have passed universal free meal programs, often funding them out of state budgets. Though passing those laws wasn't always easy. In Minnesota, for instance, you've probably already seen the joyous photo of Tim Walls being <laughs> hugged by school kids when he signed his state's program into law. But some Republican lawmakers there fiercely opposed it, offering some less than convincing arguments. Mr. President, I have yet to meet a person in Minnesota that is hungry. <laughs> yet today. I have yet to meet a person in Minnesota that says they don't have access to enough food to eat. Now, I should say that hunger is a relative term, Mr. President. <laughs> you know, I had a cereal bar for breakfast. I guess I'm hungry now. What an asshole! <laughs> First, I don't care what you had for breakfast. And second, that's not how societal problems work. You can't just go, I haven't seen hungry people, so they must not exist. Before seeing this clip, I'd never seen Chris Parnell's evil Midwestern yeah. twin, but that didn't mean you weren't out there sucking. And he wasn't the only opponent. This state rep suggested that the state expand the program, but stop short of making it universal, using herself as an example of why that'd be going too far. We are using taxpayer dollars to feed my children. I have two kids in, in, in public schools at the North Branch High School right now. That means that the taxpayers are subsidizing me to the tune of $1,376. That means right tonight, you are giving me a $1,376 tax break. Me. That's my benefit from this bill. OK. <laughs> You're welcome. Or, or, or maybe I'm sorry that happened to you. I don't really know what to say. You're saying a good thing, but you seem very upset about it. <laughs> but, but a few things about that. I know capping eligibility might sound like it makes sense, and the state actually looked into doing that, but decided against it. As it turns out, it would have increased the administrative complexity, and the increased cost would have eaten into whatever savings they might have seen. Also, crucially, by making lunch accessible to all kids, they could remove the stigma for those whose family can't afford it, which is more important than you might realise. A study in Massachusetts found that 42% of families with children eligible for free or reduced price meals reported their child would be less likely to eat a school meal if it wasn't free for all children, which does make sense. Kids are perceptive. They notice who isn't taking a lunch or is forced to eat a cold cheese sandwich, and they definitely notice whose hand got fucking stamped. <laughs> and, look, I'm not saying that there aren't complications here. Of course there are, and deep down you probably already knew that. After all, you're watching It's Always Something with White Urkel. <laughs> Making that many meals consistently is difficult. Remember, we're talking about the biggest restaurants in town, and there are a lot of... Moving parts here from the sheer scale of the programme to sourcing food and making it taste good to adequately training and paying cafeteria staff. All of which means universal free meals aren't cheap. In Minnesota, they budgeted it at $400 million over its first two years, but it's projected to cost about $80 million more than that. Though, part of the reason for that increased cost is higher than expected participation in the programme, which is obviously a good thing. Because for the final time, the benefits here are clear as the head of Minnesota's Department of Education spelled out. Our educators that I've met and that we've talked through this entire fall consistently tell me that their students are more attentive and they're ready to learn. And they directly attribute this to the availability of nutritious meals all across the state of Minnesota and throughout the day. Yeah, that is thousands of kids who aren't going to class feeling hungry, shamed or excluded. That should be the standard in all 50 states. And if it helps, Maybe we should be considering lunch as an essential school supply. You know, like books or desks. We accept that they're subsidised by the government as an investment in kids' futures. And I'd argue lunch should be too. And that the way to achieve that shouldn't be by asking each state to fund it out of their own budget, but by passing legislation at the federal level 
similar to what we did in the early days of the pandemic, because while that was a truly terrible time, it's worth also remembering that we got some major stuff done back then, too. We socially distanced, we watched Tiger King, we got our <laughs> families familiar with Zoom in a way that we're all still paying the price for. <laughs> and it turns out we fed kids. In speaking to experts for this story, many said that before 2020, they thought universal free meals would be incredibly beneficial and it would also never happen. America just doesn't do that sort of thing. But then it did happen, and seemingly overnight, and in this one particular area, Americans got to experience what it was like to have the federal government be responsive to the needs of the vulnerable. And once you see what it looks like to help kids, you kind of can't unring that bell. In fact, you should keep ringing it so fucking hard the rope comes off in your hands. Cos we have the power to ensure <laughs> that no kid in this country is hungry when school gets dismissed, and we should be exercising that power and making sure that all kids are, in the words of America's second favourite moonwalking <laughs> werewolf of the 80s, roaring ready and rock steady <laughs> with pizza, burgers, <laughs> and, of course, desserts. <laughs>